and we are live. Welcome back to another episode of The Pursuit. A little different format this time, but he is Jeff, and I am John, and we are on the relentless pursuit of truth and transformation. We've got another show today. We don't have a guest. You're the guest. No, you're the guest. I'm sitting in the yellow chair. The blue chair is always reserved for the guest. Oh. That's how it goes. All right, well, I guess I'm the guest today. Then. <laughs> Uh, but I tell you what, we are sponsored today uh, by an incredible company. We've talked about them before, but Cornerstone Payment Systems. They are a merchant service solutions uh, company that serves this broadcast, and we believe that they will faithfully serve your business or ministry. Whether you got a brick and mortar business, an online business, they'll serve your business so a with credit card processing. Because okay, yeah, okay. just answered it. Because there's people out there going, "What the you heck?" Didn't let, I have put a it comma. Is a merchant service solutions solutions company. company. Bottom yeah. line is, if you do anything online transactionally, that's right, they'll handle it. Or it doesn't have to be online. If you have, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. brick and mortar. That is That's like right. an old school term right there. You own a Chick-fil-A, I think they'll be able to help you. Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, uh, or Joe's Flower Shop. Yeah. If you have a business location, whether it's online or in, in person, these guys can take care of you. They have all kinds of amazing solutions. I've done business with these guys for a long time with my ministry and some other things that I've done, and, yep. and they've always served me incredibly well. Best thing, though, is you can call them. You know how you always get those tolls that show up on your bill? Uh-huh. Toll free. Toll free. It's a new thing. <laughs> it's a new thing. 888-506-0208. And they or, have a cool special, by the way. But go ahead. Tell me you can also it. get them um, on, it's called the World Wide Web. You, you've seen this w before? www.cornerstonepaymentsystems.com. Yep. They're your group. Nick Logan and his team, family-owned business, faith-based, great folks. Uh, you, you can't find a better better provider and they have great rates and so they'll take great care of you That's and today it. we uh as you mentioned at the at the get-go we are live on facebook today yep um and of course if you're watching this on youtube later then then that's cool too but uh we we hopefully have an opportunity we'll see how this works an opportunity to be a little bit more interactive mm -hmm. for anybody that might catch us on facebook uh this afternoon watching this watching this broadcast um shoot us a shoot us a note and uh, we'll be happy to interact with you as we get into today's topic. So, I'll be occasionally down here, and it's, it's not that I'm playing solitaire, but I do have that open. But uh, I'll be looking to see if we got any questions or inter interaction yeah. or whatever. Well, we've so, got a we've got a great topic today. I'm actually very excited about this about this topic. I'm also um, a little bit nervous. I'll be honest with mm -hmm. you, because it is a topic that. Um, is a little electrifying okay that uh people get pretty tied into emotionally i know for good reason and it's certainly at the top of the you know, right at the surface of our culture today of things that are that are you know really hanging its head out there and i think i think creating some consternation within the body of believers as well as you know yeah. everyone else that's one of the things that we're wanting to make sure that we always allow for is timely events that are happening around the world that we really, I mean, we're asking God for discernment, understanding, just like I know everyone else is as well, about how to really understand these times that we're living in, that we might be the most effective that we can be in our ministry, in our business, or otherwise, in our families, at school, whatever it is. Um, and this is certainly one of those topics that's very timely. Well, one of the things we're really pressing in on, and you've probably seen the theme if you've been following the pursuit for any time now, Obviously, our tagline is the relentless pursuit of truth and transformation, but but it's really trying to examine and explore all areas of our lives that need to fall under the lordship of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? All mm -hmm. areas, not just not just what we do on, at church, not just a theological understanding of how to break down scripture and and different stances on different positions and what it looks like to eat well and fitness, you know, our fitness and everything else that goes along with yeah, it. Yeah, it, there's, an, there's an extension of that that is radical enough, I think, to talk about, oh, mental health falls under the lordship of Jesus right. Christ. The what, what I do with my fork should fall under the lordship of Jesus Christ. How I exercise, all of these different peripheral things. But tee up what we're going to be talking about, because I don't know that a lot of people have connected the way that our faith should play out in this area of life. Well, you know... There's certain things, I think, John, we, we get conditioned to, right, mm -hmm. as, as we grow up. And it, and it comes from the household typically that we're in, the, 
the, the neighborhood in some cases that, that we belong to, and you get conditioned mm -hmm. to believe certain things and to, and to follow into a certain pattern. And part of what Paul talks about in Scripture is, you know, that we have to, that transformation begins with the renewing of the mind, right? That's right. And it's this idea and this realization that you and I aren't made for this world. Mm -hmm. So we need to stop thinking as such. We need to stop thinking the way the world thinks. We need to stop processing things the way the world processes. We need to stop um, prioritizing things the way the world prioritizes. And we need to begin to gain this new understanding of what it means to be a kingdom citizen. And specifically the topic we're going to talk about today is what, what does it mean to be a citizen of the kingdom, specifically as it relates to our voting, hmm. and how we vote, and, and how we make decisions on how we vote? And again, back to what I was saying earlier, I think we get conditioned into a certain mindset, and you might have been raised in a home that was predominantly Democrat or predominantly Republican. And, and then it comes a time, right, we get out on our own, we become mm -hmm. of legal voting age, and we have to now begin to think on our own, right? Hopefully. Yeah, and, and I'll bet you that somebody that's watching us to this point, don't, don't turn it off yet, because this is not a, okay, this is a Christian, are these guys conservative? Yeah. Uh, is this a Donald Trump commercial? No. This is not an endorsement. Right. This isn't a, um, a trying to sway our audience to think one way or the other about which party they should support. In fact, we're going to kind of get at that very issue of it, should we as Christians be aligned with one party versus the other? And you know, this is a, this is a fresh word right now because yeah. um, you know we're, we've been talking about this for several weeks now, if not months, just kind of behind the scenes. You and I just yeah. kind of pressing into it and and watching things unfold politically around our country and seeing the chaos and the confusion and. Who do you believe and what media outlet do you watch? And, you know, there's all kinds of things that are being thrown at us right now. And so it's the idea of what does it take for you and I, uh, as followers of Christ, to take a step back and go, okay, I need to gain a perspective that's not of this world. And that's, that's really what our conversation is going to be about today is, is what is the framework that God gives us mm -hmm. as citizens? And, and, and we've got to go back to that, that basic principle or we're going to get way off target. And really, in any area, if you think about, I mean, this exercise that we're about to go through really should play out in every area of our life. When we're in the heat of that argument, okay, are we able to take a step back from a third-party perspective and say, God, am I even right in this? And if I'm right, am I right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and we, we have to get in the, in the habit of checking our hearts making sure that our actions and our words are aligned to who we say we are and who we believe ourselves to be as sons and daughters of God in the relentless pursuit of truth and transformation. And we have to be willing because transformation implies change. Mm -hmm. You got to have, you can't have, you can't be in a steady place and expect transformation. Say, I'm not going to change, but I just am, am so aligned with truth that I, I'm just, I am where I'm at and my feet are, are like concrete kind of dug in right? You're not going to be transformed. Mm -hmm. So this is a great exercise. So as we talk about what this means, um, it should really play out and it's a good habit to get in, in the rest of our lives. Well, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the journey that I've been on. And maybe that's a starting point for us today is a couple Sundays ago, I was getting ready for church. And um, one of the things I rarely, if ever do, is turn on the television on a Sunday morning. I just, first of all, I don't turn the TV on that much, period. Yeah, got it. But uh, we're getting ready for church and, and I'm waiting for Sherry, my wife, and and uh, I happened to turn on the TV, and the channel that it opens to is ac actually channel two, of mm -hmm. all things. And so I'm watching a public broadcasting kind of a channel, I think it was, and there was a televangelist on there. And, and I'm not opposed to televangelists, but I don't watch televangelists. But it Hold just, on. One second. Are we televangelists? Do we actually qualify? I think we're web evangelists. Web evangelists. Okay. So that's different. Yeah. I just want to make sure. No, that's that, fine. That's good clarification. Because I've got a white suit that's hanging right over there, and I'll put it oh, on. Geez. Here we go. I see, apologize. I digress. I, I just see the problem with live, John. We yeah, can't edit those things. I know. Out. I know. I know. <laughs> that's what you pay me for, though. So. All right. So back anyway, to back to my story. So I turn it on channel two, and it, it, matter of fact, there happened to be a, a, a guest speaker that uh -huh. particular Sunday. He was standing at the pulpit, and it caught my attention. 
because it wasn't what I was expecting what this guy was talking about. He was talking about this concept of kingdom voting. What I later found out is that his name is David Barton, okay. um, and he has been an advisor to the current administration. Mm -hmm. um, back in 2016, he's an advisor in 2020. So he was talking about this concept, but he wasn't, he wasn't promoting Republican. Yep. He wasn't promoting Trump. Mm -hmm. He was just saying, let's get the very conversation we're having right now. Let's get back to the foundation and the basics as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, what we are held responsible for. Okay. You used the term right there, though. What'd you say? Kingdom voting. That may be a new term yeah. to a lot of people. Because the idea is we feel like that um, we either have to align ourselves with one party or the other. Right? Yeah. Because that's what we're handed, if, if we're really honest with ourselves. There's, there's not other candidates available out there, so it feels like you're being forced into one path or the other. Mm -hmm. So if you're being forced down one path or the other, how in the world do you make kingdom minded decisions mm -hmm. as it relates to how we vote and who we elect to lead us as a nation, right? There's a term out there, have you heard it called voting your conscience? You heard, heard yeah, this term before? Sure. And and it's it's crazy because what you're talking about, um, and, and I don't want to jump too far ahead because I know we're going to get there, but to uh, what is a conscience? Conscience is actually something that God gifted to us, mm -hmm. it's put, put within us. Um, it's a mechanism within us that keeps us on the right track. Con means with, science and knowledge. So with knowledge, we understand what we're doing is either aligned with the word and his command, or it's not aligned. And if it's not, then that conscience gives us an opportunity to rethink, repent, to correct our ways, to realign with what, uh, what we know we are and who we know uh, we serve. And so there is this idea of conscience, or voting your conscience and, and it's crazy because you Google that term and there's a million articles on why you should not do that. And the reason that everyone cites um, really played out in Florida. You remember the Bush Gore election mm -hmm. and Nader got like 100,000 votes in Florida. And Florida, this was the hanging Chad deal. Remember that whole thing? If you're young, go Google it. it you'll find it. Okay, so um, that deal was decided by like 700 votes. And everyone sort of blamed those people that vote their conscience, right? Because to vote your conscience is sort of analogous to finding the underdog, the write-in candidate that, you know, that says, I don't agree with any their platforms, their stances on all these issues. So because I can't agree with anyone, I, and the only guy I can agree to is this, my uncle, I'm going to write him in. And so there is a very negative, I think, connotation out there with voting your conscience. Mm. So, so with that, with that backdrop, and I think that's that's important for us to think about those mm -hmm. kind of things. Is so then what what is the foundation for which we're voting from? Right? Yeah, is it is it something that's been handed to you down the generations? My mom and dad were Democrats, so I'm going to be Democrat, and that's just the way I'm always going to vote. Mm -hmm. Or is there something deeper to it? Now, as citizens of the kingdom, there's a, the point of this, this this episode today is to make the point that absolutely there is something very significant about being a citizen of the kingdom. Let's start with this. What's a kingdom? It's, it's important for us to understand that. What is a kingdom? The domain What's unique of a kingdom? about a kingdom? It, it's the domain of a king. Okay. Is, yeah. a, is a kingdom democratic in its nature? A, a kingdom is, no, it's, it's sort of, um, it's theocratic. It's kingocratic, if you will. That's right. <laughs> Which basically means what? What he says or she says goes. Whatever the king established That's it. is the rules of the land. That's right. So as citizens of the kingdom, how much input and say-so do we have into the things for which the king decrees? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> well, if you look at the, you know, you study the old kingdoms, yeah. the basic people like you and I, we yeah. have zero. Yeah. Matter of fact, you didn't even enter into the presence of the king. That's right. For fear of your life being taken. That's right. right? Unless you're invited into the presence of the mm -hmm. king, mm -hmm. which is a whole other thing. That's a whole other sermon that'll preach, by the way. But, but so in a in a theocracy, and as a citizen of a theocracy, we we don't we don't we're not afforded the privilege of having an opinion. We talked mm -hmm. about this on an episode a couple episodes ago with 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 Jason McKay, that we're not afforded the opportunity of an opinion because our opinion is given to us. Mm -hmm. Opinion is given to us as a citizen of the kingdom, okay? 
So if that's true, we need to understand the edicts and the principles of the king for which we represent. Mm -hmm. That's why the word of God is so important. You know, I, I heard a I heard a conversation that and Tony Evans preached on this very topic, which by the way, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you just Google in Tony Evans King Kingdom Voting. Voting. Yeah. And it's an amazing sermon that he delivers and he talks about this in, in great detail. But one of the things he talks about in the in that particular uh, sermon is he talks about that the father has made the king has made covenants with his people mm -hmm. in the kingdom and you remember this he talked about the four primary covenants that that God has made with his people the first covenant is a personal covenant that he makes between you and him right that he's going to be with you he's never going to leave you never going to forsake you yeah. it's about salvation it's about the things for which he's established for us right right the second covenant he makes is, is a covenant of family and the importance of, of what that looks like and, and the importance of the family unit. And he speaks of the covenant nature that he has around family, uh, about the, you know, the husband being the, the head of the household and, and all those kind of things that God establishes as it relates to a family. Mm. Um, the third one he talks about is the covenant that he's made with the church. The church is his people, mm -hmm. his unity, the covenant and the promises that he's made with the church. And the fourth one is the covenant, which I will call a national covenant that he's made with the country. And as we look at that, there are there's multiple principles, and if I could use the word edicts, that God has established for his country. Yep. That says, these are the laws that I've established. I'll call them non-negotiables. These are the things that I say, there's no, there's no argument in this. Right. Otherwise known as the Ten Commandments. I, I was right. going to say, there's, there's not only are there no arguments with it, he actually took the time, Scripture says, to write it on your heart. That's right. <laughs> that's not like a that's not like a a felt um, Bible. Uh, um, what do you call it? Little children's Bible study yeah. or whatever. In the little, this is actually. It says the, the Bible says that we show the the work of the law written on our hearts, that our conscience bears witness. Yeah. So he's connected that harness I was talking about before. That's sort of the right wrong harness, the mechanism. He's connected that to the very edicts that you're describing, the Ten Commandments, the tablets, if you will, that uh, that are no longer in uh, in uh, in, a, in a temple, but rather in the temple that that God has created in us. So 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 back to that point, because this is really important yeah. to grasp. This is is I think where where most of us make the mistake. Mm -hmm. And I'm including myself into this, this conversation, okay? This isn't a pointing a finger at anyone else, first at myself, and then if it applies to you, mm -hmm. awesome. I want you to think about this. Is oftentimes we'll recognize God the person, mm -hmm. but we fail to recognize God's policies. Yeah. In other words, you see followers of Christ that say, no, I, I believe in God. However, I'm going to vote my conscience as it relates to these other issues. And the problem with that is God says, no, 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 no. I've already established the policies. Mm -hmm. You are to align yourself to my policies. You don't align yourself with a party. That's right. You line yourself up as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That's your party. Mm -hmm. I love how Tony said it. He said, if you lean Democratic, or if you lean Republican, then you better refer to yourself as Republican light, or Democratic uh, light, yeah. because you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That's your party, and the, and the Father, the King, has already established the policies, and you are to vote according to my policies. You know what he actually defines kingdom voting? I was listening to this, this quote. The opportunity and responsibility to partner with God to expand his rule in society through civil government. It is incumbent upon Christians to first and foremost ascribe themselves not to a political party, but to the superintending governance of God through civil government. Now, I did have to look up a couple of those words. <laughs> superintending, try to add that to your vocabulary. But the point is, again, we it's not just our opportunity but as kingdom citizens, our responsibility that 
that the way that we partner with God to ensure that our civil government, which by the way, you and I get a hand in, that, like you, you mentioned before, could we go before the king in a theocracy? No, we couldn't. But in this system of democracy that we have, we have the ability to have input into the law of the land and to ensure that the law of the land is aligned with the word of God. So that's a great point. So it, you're, you're, you're making my point for me. Because the first thing that what, what Tony talks about in that definition, and it's based out, I believe, Romans 13 is where he's mm-hmm. speaking out of. Mm-hmm. I, the first thing it requires, though, is that you what? You have to first acknowledge yeah. God. No doubt. You first have to acknowledge God. Now, here's the deal. If, if you don't invite God into a government, mm-hmm. if you don't in, invite God into that process, what, in essence, you're doing is you're opening the door for chaos, mm-hmm. injustice, um, lack of freedom, yep. lack of safety, all the things that he's already established. He, I hate to quit. I keep quoting Tony Evans, but he's so good. Yeah, he is. And he says, a covenant is like this. It's like an umbrella. Uh If it's raining outside, the umbrella protects you from the rain. That's the covenant that's been placed over you. Does it stop the raining? No. But it protects you from the rain. So we live in a fallen, broken world, Mm -hmm. right? Things are out of control right now all over the world. And that's just because it's fallen, because the enemy, right, is is reigning right now, and his and God has given him some some domain to do to do what he does in these last days. So the question is, how do we establish the covenant while it's raining? Mm-hmm. How do we walk in the covenant so we're protected from the rain, even though it's raining? And he says the first thing we have to do is acknowledge him. He has to be invited into the process. So to put it another way, when we invite God into the process, when we invite God into the government, Mm -hmm. he provides us safety. He provides us justice. He provides us freedom. He provides righteousness. Right? And and I would say, if I'm going to put on the devil's advocate hat, I, I agree with you, but somebody out there is right now thinking about, do you know all the atrocities that have been committed in the name of God? Right? And they'll, and, you know, they'll start listing them. And that's the thing. Is like it, so to one, they're saying that. To another, they're saying, okay, if I'm supposed to vote according to being a kingdom citizen, aligned with the word, okay, my goodness, you mentioned Romans 13 earlier, Hutch, and I don't know that I could quote one verse out of Romans 13. So does that mean I have to internalize it? How do I prioritize the massive amount of scripture that's out there? The 613 commandments or something that are out there, right? How do I actually practically say, okay, what's what's the first thing I need to do in order to align myself to vote the right way? Yeah, so we, you know, this is back to my story. When I turned on the channel a couple couple Sundays ago, David Barton is speaking, and he speaks to this. He speaks, he lists out five, what he referred to is priorities mm-hmm. of the king. Okay, mm-hmm. so I wanted to, we're gonna discuss these. Okay. You and I have talked about these, but I want to discuss them because we, we had some debate back and forth about a couple of them. A couple, yeah. And, uh, and so we're going to lay out these, what we would call these, these five things that, that the Father says, the King says, these are my policies. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. No argument, yeah. no opinion. You have to align yourself to these things, okay? okay? The first three come straight out of the Ten Commandments, okay? Yep. The first one is, is we already mentioned it. Life. Acknowledge. No, we oh, yeah, you that. That. Acknowledge, acknowledge, God. acknowledge me. Yep. Acknowledge God. Invite me into the process. Am I a part of your health care program? Am I a part of your government? Am I a part of your public schools? Am I a part of your businesses? Mm-hmm. Have you invited me? Have you acknowledged me? And are you asking me to be a part of the process? Because again, where God is absent, what will exist? Mm. A lack of safety, chaos. a lack of justice, Fear. a lack of righteousness, yeah. chaos. Okay, That void will be filled by a God of some kind. It's a vacuum. Yeah. If you take God out, something is going to get sucked into it. And will be called God, by the way. that's You want to find an idol? Look for a vacuum. That, that's a great point. That's a great point. So the first one is acknowledge me. Mm-hmm. It's one of the commandments. Acknowledge me. There shall be no other idols before me, no other gods before me. I must... Be first. I'm the first to last. Yep. Right? Alpha and the Omega. So the first one talks about is when you're voting, look at the candidate 
And do they acknowledge God? Not just acknowledge him as I know him. Because uh-huh. remember what we talked about. It's first about the person, and then secondly about the policies. Are his policies being established? So I'm going to talk about some of those policies now. Okay. The second one is life. Do not take innocent life. Yeah. Now, this is speaking directly to the issue of abortion. I don't, you know, there, there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of arguing out there as to when life becomes life. Mm-hmm. When in the embryo does a baby become a life? Right. You know, to the point now to where some believe that life doesn't happen until the baby is actually born. Right. Right? And so those are things we have to consider, John. It's a tough topic, mm-hmm. dude, and I know it's a sensitive topic. And there's a lot of people out there that, that have some very strong opinions on this. But this is, in my opinion, this is what the Word of God says, is, is you have to look at the position that the candidate takes on this issue of yep. life. All right? Yep. Now, that's not to say, in the first two that you listed of, of the five, and I'm not sure that, is it five, is it seven, is it three, is it right? We're just, picking, this a few, was, we're just picking a few. There's yeah, many exactly. topics we could probably hit on. But that is not to say that there is one command that's greater than another within that list, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess a couple of places my brain is going on that, but the Pharisees went to Jesus and, and said that, hey, weigh out the law, what's more important, right? Yeah. Um, and he said that there's really the ten boil down to the two. Mm-hmm. Love the Lord your God with all, the, all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, that's right? right? And and if you do that, you've, you're fulfilling the other ten. That's right. The other thing that's bubbling up for me is we've talked with our, our friend Dr. Smith, the archaeolinguist. I learned how to say that word since the last time we interviewed him. And uh, and he said to us, um, as he's kind of taking us through some mentoring around kind of the historical church, um, he's, he asked the question, if if you take away one of the Ten Commands, how many do we, we you have left? And I quickly answered nine. But and me, too. I, I almost to the point of I didn't want to say it because I, I was thinking, Okay, there is a trick here. And there was. <laughs> he said, no, you take away one, there's zero, right? And why is that? Because you've just taken, the, the other nine are held up by, by the authority that the one that you just threw out was. That's right. So you throw out the one, you've thrown out the authority for right. all ten, right? That's right. So you, all that to say, you're not prioritizing those two uh, and, not, and saying that the other eight are not important. That's right. But they're pretty evident right now. If you were to take those two and to sort of use them as a litmus test out there to say, if I just took those two, that may be enough to start to make a distinction. Well, part, you know, part of what David Barton talked about in his talk is that, because again, he, he advises candidates when they're running for an office, mm. whatever office that might be. Right. And he said the average candidate runs on about 40 to 50 different items that they're gonna they're they're gonna represent within what's called their platform okay. right okay. and he said a vast majority of those really the bible doesn't the king hasn't spoken into okay the king hasn't said this is an absolute mm-hmm. like immigration okay right there, there's there's no real true guidance in scripture about what the king says about immigration sure taxes matter of fact taxes what did jesus say about taxes he said, "Yeah, pay, you give Caesar's yeah. what's Caesar's, render to Caesar's, right? to Caesar's, yeah. Just pay it. Yeah, that, that's part of what you do. That's, that's part of how things operate. And that's how part of things function. And these governments function is if that's what they want, give it to them. So there's many of those forty to fifty items that a candidate runs on. The yeah. king doesn't really have really much to say about it. What we're really pointing out is in those forty to fifty items that are that are on the platform, which is the one that the king has spoken into? Yes, this, yeah. this is, is important. To me. Is it fair? Okay, so if we zero in on those, but you mentioned immigration, and, and somebody out there may, may be saying, oh, what do you mean God didn't say anything about that? If you apply, though, what he's given us, it says love, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. So now we have to discern what does it mean to love our neighbor mm-hmm. as it relates to immigration? What's the best way we can love our physical neighbor, ensuring that they're in the safest, most protected sure. environment? What's the best way we could love the person that wants to get to our neighborhood? And right. He, here's here's a breakdown. That's a great. I'm glad you brought that up. Here's a great discussion about that. So the the, the Democratic Party mm-hmm. has more of an open borders right. mindset as it relates to immigration, and I don't want to speak for them, but my guess is their belief is, you know what, if if they desire to come and live in our country, then we're gonna we're gonna give them that opportunity, and that's the way 
I'm assuming that they're they're choosing to consider that issue right versus on the other side that the, the more conservative side would be say it's not that we're against immigration but we're going to create processes and and protections to put in place because that's another way of loving your neighbor that's right again we're assuming the best mm -hmm. of both parties and their Agreed. intentions agree because we we need to we because we, we don't have anything else to go by other than that so right. let's, let's take it from that position so the first one was acknowledging God. The second one was this issue of not to take innocent life. The third one, uh, th this is one that Barton shared that I was like, huh, I've never really thought of this commandment in this way. And it's the okay. commandment we've all heard, do not commit adultery. Uh -huh. And so when I share that commandment to you, what's the first thing that just comes to your mind? Clearly, sexual impropriety. A outside of uh, the marriage. constitution of marriage. Right. So it's interesting because he took it a step further and he's, he took it to the issue of the constitution of marriage, mm -hmm. defined uh -huh. as the biblical definition of the constitution of marriage being between, between a man and a woman. Yeah, sort of. That. And so his 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 interpretation that he was playing out on this issue was: what is the candidate's position on marriage in the nuclear family? Kind of what the definition of that is. And yeah. the idea that's that's kind of a, a term that's been surfacing a lot, yeah. right? This election year is yeah. this concept of the nuclear family and what that means and how do you define that and so um, the thought is that the thing we consider here is a policy of the king and again I'm going to encourage all of you go back into the word of God and discern it yourself so right. the cool thing about it John is you and I have the Holy Spirit within us if Amen. you're a follower of Jesus and you've asked him in your life you have the Holy Spirit within you to help you to discern and understand the word of God this is part of that framework we're talking about it is and so you may look at that and go, you know what, I, I just don't see it in Scripture. Press in and ask the Father, to, to the King, right, to show you these truths. Yeah. But he speaks of this idea that says, what's the candidate's position on this issue of marriage? Mm -hmm. do, do, they, do they see marriage as, as a biblical definition between a man and a woman? Or is it more of a progressive you know, viewpoint of marriage in terms of uh, same-sex marriage, those sort of things? And that speaks to this issue of adultery. Interesting connection. Okay? Yep. The fourth one. The fourth and the fifth are different than the first three. The first three come straight out of the great, you know, the Ten Commandments. These next two are what I would say, it, it, it's, not, it's not an absolute from the standpoint of if you don't do this, then, um, you know, you're, you're in direct disobedience to God right. and, and you're condemned to hell. It's not anything like that. It's not anything like that. Okay. So the first one is, is this issue of the position of the candidate as it relates to Israel. Mm -hmm. in, in the book of Genesis, it talks about those who bless Israel will be blessed, those who curse Israel will be cursed. Yep. This is speaking to this issue of the righteousness of the land. You remember we were talking about inviting God into this, this national covenant mm -hmm. that, that extends to a blessing over the land. If we desire, again, inviting God into the process, his, not only the person, recognizing the person, but the policies, as we, as, as we recognize the policies of God, as we recognize the policies of the king, and we follow those policies, the promises are safety, mm -hmm. justice, protection, Provision, righteousness, right? Justice, all those kind of things. Freedom. And so one of the one of the policies is, God says clearly, if you bless Israel, I will bless you. Yeah. So what's the candidate's position on Israel? A very timely topic. And that was one of the things that, that I kind of pushed back on, on you a little bit on. And I know that you know you're you're reciting what mm -hmm. you what you read, and, and I think there's acknowledgement there. We have to be careful. You know, I, my joke back to you was, well, I'm not going to vote for candidate X because he eats meat of the parted hoof, and that violates Leviticus 23, right? right. So we could take it down to a degree, and and we could sort of. I don't want us to ever be guilty of taking scripture and sort of manipulating it sure. to sort of fit our sure. narrative, if you will, sure. right? So while I agree that that's an important thing, because um, he, he said it in the way that he said it in Genesis, and the promise is so all-encompassing, and so why wouldn't we want 
that benefit, right? Yeah, if we do that, you know, if you bless them, I'll bless you, and in this way, and your cup will run over. That's a pretty good promise right there. Yeah. So it sort of elevates the power, if you will, of alignment with that promise. And if we can get ourselves again in the habit of questioning our own paradigms from the perspective of God, and you said it, am I right in this? If I'm not right, Holy Spirit, show me that I'm not. He's mm -hmm. our teacher. It's mm -hmm. a good word. All right, the last one. Yeah. The last one's interesting, too. This comes out of um, Isaiah. I believe it's chapter 1. I'm going to have to look it up. And um, the prophet is speaking about, remember what I said earlier, as we invite God in the person and the policies. Yeah. Part of what happens is what follows when we do that is righteousness. Let's define righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous? Your position in an alignment before God is is you're in the right place and aligned with His purposes. Yeah. Simply put, you're in right standing with the Father. Right standing. You're in right standing with the King. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. As a kid, when I was raised up, my dad was six. I was a little guy. It was good to be in right standing with the King. Yeah. With the Father. Right. Your dad is. When I was man. when I was in right standing with the Father, things went well. When I was not in right standing with the Father, things didn't go so well. That's right. So right standing is a good thing. Now, the problem is, this is a sub-lesson, the problem is, I think, um, many of us have a false understanding of what right standing looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay, right? let's talk about that. That's a good one. Because... That's a show by itself. It but, is. Yeah. And, and we can get way down that trail, but yeah, so good. often we think right standing has to do with everything with how we perform. Yeah. It really has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the blood of Jesus. And when we declare the blood of Jesus over us, right standing is instant. He has made us righteous. We are the righteousness of God. But not just there. It didn't stop there. It says you're the righteousness of God in Christ. That's right. So our position in Christ makes us the righteousness of God. It has God. nothing right. to do with our actions and our behavior. That's right. And all those kind of things. Everything That's to right. do with Jesus. Yep. Jesus, period. And our actions and behavior should... Follow from a position of righteousness. It flows out of righteousness. It flows, it out, flows, of flows out of Jesus. It flows out of righteousness. It's, it's all the fruits of the Spirit and all the things that we are to do. Okay. Yeah. So that's righteousness in a nutshell, real quick. So what does it mean to be a righteous nation? Is for the nation to be in right standing with the Father. Mm -hmm. For the righteousness to be, of the nation is to be in right standing with the King. It's important. Are we inviting Him in? Do we recognize Him as a person? And are we establishing His policies in our civil governments? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so this idea of, of righteousness, um, Isaiah 126. Isaiah 126, yeah. it says this. One of the ways that the nation is righteous yeah. is through the judges. Through the judges you elect. Because after all, what do the judges do? They interpret what? They in, well, well, they uphold the standard of the law of the land with integrity. That's right. That where where you, it's sort of the the scales right the um, the two scales making sure that those things are balanced to say here's the law of the land I'm measuring this action I'm measuring this word against what the law is in a way that where there is no lack of intent and it's good stuff because right. it connects two pieces okay the judges don't determine the law right they just they're given the law they're given the law. Yeah. And their job is to make sure the law is maintained. That's good. And the proper judgment is made as it relates to whether or not that law was broken. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's all they do. The other side of the legislative side, they're the ones that establish the laws. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so beautiful about our system and this government is you have these checks and balances, right? Between the judicial branch right. and the legislative branch. And as the leg legislative branch, branch establishes the law, it's up to the judges to uphold the law. And both of those in conjunction, under the authority of God, carry out the laws and the policies of the king, which For then sure. determines the righteousness of the land. You see the connection Absolutely. there? Absolutely. And so, yep. so the, the practical application is, look at the candidates for which you're voting and which ones are appointing judges that align with the policies of the king. And, and uh, the appointment of judges has been a topic of it hot... Has debate over the last few years and I know we're, we're going long no it, no this is good and but here, here's where I was going with it I want to connect back to what opportunity do I have that 
you know, to into the process of an appointment. I can't appoint. Mm -hmm. I can cast a vote, and that vote isn't considered in the appointment. I bet it is, because the candidate which takes office, the platform which he or she represents, is all he he or she is looking for a judge that is in alignment with. That's why you it, it, the the the. the not the partiality of of, um, uh, of the judges, and I'm thinking of the Supreme Court, but when there's one up for appointment, all the debate about, oh, it's, he's going to appoint a conservative. He's going to appoint a, a liberal judge, right? And and yeah, that, that is the case, right? They, they, they come in with their, um, their, dispen, you know, their, their disposal to a certain perspective on things, mm -hmm. right? But you want to make sure that um, that we have righteous judges in the land. Make sure that the candidates that we're voting for stand for the things that we're talking about. I think because, that's the point. Because what's dangerous is even though those judges don't establish the right. laws, they interpret them. They do. And so it depends on the lens for which that particular judge is looking through, right? Mm -hmm. We all have different. There's many topics that's right and I could discuss. Yeah. And we're going to see it differently because we look through a different lens through our experiences, through our upbringing, through yeah. whatever, our understanding, our knowledge, wisdom, whatever whatever lenses we apply, that's what happens. That's why the judges are so important because they interpret the law. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to me when you can see a law and go, man, it looks really plain to me. And then a different interpretation comes out. Yeah. That's how things get really whacked pretty quick. Well, think about how many votes um, from by the Supreme Court, let's just take them, were seven to zero. Yeah, none. none. I, I, yeah. I mean, I don't maybe. know any. Uh, there sure probably is, right? But I, I and, and they put those papers out there. The the, the dissenting, yeah. what's it called, the dissenting argument or something yeah. that says, "Hey, right. I voted against this, even though it, it went through. I voted against this, and here's why: because my interpretation of the law was blah." That's right. right. That's right. So, so anyway, to, but, just to just to kind of wrap us a little bit here is is I want to go back to something. This actually comes out of Romans chapter one. And it's, uh, it starts in verse 18, and it talks about the people of that time. And the warning that Paul gives is he says, listen, when you fail to acknowledge God mm -hmm. in these areas, when you fail to acknowledge him, he says it in this way, at least in the NIV, NIV he says, if you suppress the truth of God, this is what's going to happen to you. Yeah. And he goes on and he says something really interesting. He said, what the Father will do is he will give you over to the desires of your heart, is what it says. He will give you over, specifically, to a depraved mind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what's really scary about that, John, is, and you and I have talked about this, the definition of a depraved mind is a counterfeit mind. So true. Meaning we begin to think and go after things that aren't of any value. They look like they have value, but they really have no value. Mm -hmm. And it says when we suppress the truth of God and the knowledge of God and we push him out, it says the Father gives us over to the things that are counterfeit. Yeah. And yeah. what we find ourselves in is a society and a culture that's no longer safe, that's no longer just, that's no longer um, have freedom, and is no longer righteous. And, you know, what, what's crazy, and i and I got to share this with you guys, um, something else that, that I just want to read for you. This is over in Romans 13. And this is probably a verse a lot of you are familiar with. This is uh, verse 1. It says, Everyone must, must submit himself to the governing authorities. Mm -hmm. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, get this, consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. You hear those words? Mm. Are we living in that? I mean, that is we happening are. today in cities across our country. Mm -hmm. Is is this chaos, and, and I'm going to submit to you, not because this is what I think, but because this is what the Word of God says. It's the reason why that we, we are ignoring the things of God. 
in other words, you know the way my brain interprets that? I can't produce the righteousness of God with unrighteousness. Yeah. Unrighteousness begets unrighteousness, yeah. right? And we have an opportunity, I think, in this, in this land that we live in. And, you know, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. The governing authorities of this land is in this system called democracy. And we have an opportunity and responsibility, back to those words that uh, Dr. Tony Evans used, to really determine how we're going to align ourselves with this responsibility we've been given within this country to establish God's righteousness as the law of the land, to cast our votes in a way that reflects that. 1 Corinthians 6 and 20 says something to the effect of that we, we are not our own. That's right. We were bought with a price, a high price. The blood of the Son of God is what we were bought with. And, and to your point, you said it a couple of episodes ago, we don't have the right to an opinion. And I know that you, it, what did he say? What, you know, I, I like chocolate ice cream, not vanilla ice cream, right? That's not what you're talking about. You're, that when there's, when there's um, uh, topics that fall under the auspice of this thing that I'm holding and that thing that you're holding, um, we don't have the right to an opinion on it. That's right. It's his righteousness. And uh, we need to be open, I think, Hutch, to, um, and, and like I said in the beginning, I think that as we examine our own hearts, and we're told to do that, and to, think, to determine, why is it that I think like this? Why is it that, that I, I tend to align myself here? Maybe you're exactly right, and, and examining your heart will say, yeah, I, I, yeah, I got it going on. <laughs> I'm aligned. Uh, to the degree that I that I, that I understand, um, but if we get in the habit of doing that, this is a great exercise to go through and apply in the rest of our lives. Because you know what, every day I've got the opportunity. Ask Tara, <laughs> my wife, and if I don't think that there's an opportunity during, during the day, or I think I passed the test that day. Uh, all I've got to do is ask her. I'm just teasing. She's not. She doesn't throw stones at me. But uh, but my point is, I'm certainly not perfect. And there's some. There are certainly opportunities that I can take this very same principle and say, God, how do I align better with your intention and your perfect will for my life? Because I do not want the depraved mind. I don't want the counterfeit. That's right. And at the end of the day, you and I are going to be held accountable. We are. For how we vote. We just are. It's a serious thing. It is. It's far more serious than I could have ever dreamed or imagined. Um, not because of who we are appointing as the next president of the United mm -hmm. States. It's because are we... The reason why it's so important is because we're required to align ourselves with the king. As citizens of the kingdom, we're required to align ourselves with the king. And with that is great responsibility. But also, the flip side of that is great promise, mm -hmm. protection, provision, justice, safety for the citizens. So, I, I hope this was encouraging to you today. I hope you heard our heart and what we were really trying to communicate to everyone today. And, and we're just trying to be... Uh, you know, parrots of the Word of God. That, that's that's all. That's all we're trying to do here today. And I'm just going to ask and pray that the Holy Spirit will convict and strengthen and empower and enlighten you to uh, to what it is that you're thinking as you process the very difficult decision that all of us have as a country mm -hmm. coming up here in just less than it's less it, than two months. Yeah, a couple months. It is a serious thing, but you know, to be bought at a price and to be under subjection to this thing called the law and to have these, there it's on the surface and maybe to those that, maybe there's somebody out there that's not even in Christ, has not even accepted or asked Jesus to come into their heart and be Lord of their life, that that sounds so constricting, but it's the total opposite. There's such freedom in being in right standing with the King, isn't there? It is. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, thank you for joining us for another episode of The Pursuit. Uh, there's a new blog that's out there that yeah. just dropped recently. Ira Williams has placed a yeah. new blog out there, so go check it out on thepursuitonline.com. There's a new everything around here. There's new everything. we got a new set. New studio. And we're, we're putting all this together. We're yeah. slowly building it, and so you'll see more, more and more pieces get added each, each and every week, hopefully. They're so. going to be, uh, so contributors like Ira are going to be out there as well contributing video content. That's right. Um, like this because we know that uh, we don't own the market on truth we have, uh, don't have the market cornered on truth and uh, and we know that there's there's other voices that we want to be part of this platform and, and I'm excited uh, to wake up in the morning and flip my phone on and, and to see 
uh, Rich Johnson's bright, shiny face <laughs> encouraging me with what he's uh, waking up with in the morning. So. Hey, all right. Well, we'll see you guys next time on The Pursuit. See you.